This is Speaking of Shakespeare, conversations about things Shakespearean. I'm Thomas Dabbs, broadcasting from Aoyama Gakuin University in central Tokyo. If you are joining us on YouTube and wish to listen to this program as a podcast, you may click the link below to your favorite podcast platform. This talk is with Edward Wilson Lee of Sydney Sussex College, University of Cambridge. Edward is the author of Shakespeare in Swahili Land, and more recently, a book entitled The Catalog of Shipwrecked Books. He has also co-authored a study of the library of Hernando Colon with Jose Maria Perez Fernandez. He also has a book forthcoming entitled A History of Water, being an account of a murder, an epic, and two visions of the new world. This series is funded with institutional support from Aoyama Gakuin University and with a generous grant from the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science. Edward, your recent work with this myriad points of interest ostensibly seems to wander here and there and everywhere in ways that are wonderful. But given that we're in the age of hyper-specialization, and focus of fields rigidly defined, your recent work might seem to some of us as being as eccentric and quixotic as some of the people you have encou encountered in your research. Are you a modern day man of La Mancha, one might ask. It takes a second, perhaps third look at the whole of your recent corpus to understand why you journeyed back into Eastern Africa in search of Shakespeare and then followed this journey with two books, one co-authored about the history of books and libraries that revolve around the life and dreams of Hernando Colon, Columbus's son. Soon out, another book about two quixotic Renaissance figures. How does all this work collectively to find some shape, some form, one might ask. You have left many signposts in your writing as an answer. I think because you examine how the Renaissance quests for shape and form were necessarily marked by errant adventure. Sometimes the quest for one thing failed, but led to the discovery of something else. There were quests to determine the shape of the geographical globe, of course, with, of course, some horrible outcomes. But there was also an information boom and a desire to find shape in the tsunami of printed works churned out by the technology of movable type. You argue that Cologne's efforts to organize his library reflects the birth of a dream for universal understanding and knowledge. A dream that was in place long before Shakespeare and many other Renaissance writers took on the challenge of giving form to the vernacular language. A dream for these poets that would have never been realized without travel of people and books over oceans and rivers, without water. May we ask you first to give a brief sketch of, your, of the travels of your formative years, and then give us a look at what we may expect from your forthcoming book title, a kind of Victorian title, A History of Water, being an account of a murder, an epic, and two visions of a new world. Thank you, Tom, for that very generous introduction and the, uh, the overview of my work, which I think you've probably done a better job of, of synthesizing and summarizing than I'll be able to do myself but um, uh, yes so uh, as you've intuited uh, the the peripatetic nature of my work uh, is probably derived in large part from the um, you know the, the, the fact that my life has uh, uh, been one of, of movement and I've always been someone with slightly itchy feet uh, and so, uh, you know, the excitement of a new project often has to do, for me, with the excitement of new places and, and thinking about things from an, a new perspective. Um, so, as you say, I, I, I was born um, in a little farming town in Ohio, uh, in, uh, in America, as you can recognize the obvious Buckeye accent. Um, but uh, I didn't live there. I think I lived there for about six weeks um, uh, before my parents moved uh, briefly to Idaho and then back to, uh, to East Africa, which is where they, they met. So my father is, is American, my mother is, is, is British, and they met um, uh, out in East Africa where both of them moved um, uh, shortly after university uh, to, to become wildlife conservationists. And, and so I spent my, my childhood growing up 
in East Africa, trailing them around on, on safari around what I still think of as the most beautiful part of, uh, of the world. But I've, I've seen some challenges since, but nothing that's quite taken it from my heart. Um, yes, and I, you know, I, I, um, I was always a slightly kind of bookish youth. Uh, and I think, again, one of the things that probably unites some of my interests in, in the various books is the effect that place has on reading and on books as objects, what happens to books when you take them to unexpected places and when you write them in unexpected places um, and, and when you store them in unexpected places. So I think there's a sort of thread through, um, through my writing of, of uh, you know, libraries in, uh, in caves and on ships and, um, uh, you know, books being hauled across deserts and through jungles and, and, and what that does to the reading of them and, and why people do this. Um, so I, I think there are uh, lots of connective threads that, that probably um, derive through that. And I, I think, I hope it is the case, as you say, uh, that there, despite these things appearing very um, scattered to, you know, in an age of hyper-specialization, that there is a lot of connective threads. And I think, you know, one of them, is in a sense the age of hyper specialization. Um, so I, I think, you know, to a certain extent, the the book on Hernando Colon, uh, you know, the, the illegitimate son of Columbus who tries to build a universal library, is in part about the effect uh, of uh, information surges and the ways in which it means that each of us only sees a little part of the world. Um, that the you know the library of the world becomes so immense. Uh, that each of us is is confined to a little corner of it, and what that does to our our view of the world. And I suppose the um, the, the new book um, out this um, out, out this summer is a, in some ways a continuation of that. So this time, instead of being about uh, libraries and the and the new world um, and the Americas, it's about archives and the old world. So this is about um, Portugal's encounter with India and China uh, and Japan even, um, and uh, the archives uh, to which information was sent about these places uh, in, uh, back in, in Portugal. So, so centered around the, the Torre do Tombo archive in, in, in Portugal um, and various other locations. And the, the title is, I suppose, sort of a, um, a poetic provocation of sorts. Uh, so in part, it's about the, um, the absurdity of the idea of writing a history of water, water which cannot effectively be divided, uh, which has no specific chronology or history and therefore um, isn't uh, really able to be written about historically in any obvious sense. Um, and I suppose that, that was in part an, an attempt to draw our attention to the centrality to our, our writing of history of our dividing up of places and times, right? So periodization and geographical specialization um, seem like to a certain extent necessary evils when we write history, but in fact, they have an enormous determining effect on the kind of history that we write. One of the central characters in the new book, um, Damiel de Goish, who is the, the archivist of the Torre do Tombo archive um, uh, in Lisbon, and who fortunately for my purposes dies in a grisly and mysterious way um, at the beginning of the book. So the book takes the form of a murder mystery, and this is you know, even further, an even greater provocation to the world of academic specialization, my decision to write the new book as a murder mystery. But um, he um, he's a kind of fascinating figure in that he, um, is sort of preternaturally resistant to some of the moves to divide up the world and to think of the world as separate and unrelated and having centers and peripheries compared to a lot of people in his period. Um, and he, uh, he's very interested in polyphonic music and the ways in which concord and discord, you know, dis even things that um, you know, uh, might seem to some people dissonance can form a, a kind of harmony. So he's very interested in his history writing and finding um, harmonies across the world, you know, things that, that um, have a kind of echo, a kind of uh, cultural echo across the world. You think of so, water music, I, I think you've, you've, and I think there's uh, in, uh, I don't know, one of the previews to your book, there's a quotation, it goes to water music, doesn't it? 
Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. There's a fascinating period, um, anecdote in his life where he's, um, it's during his period of study at Louvain, uh, the University of Louvain or Leuven, um, where he takes a group of his friends out into the woods um, and explains to him, uh, explains to them his theory of, of how um, the, 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 the music of water works. Um, and he talks about, um, you know, uh, channels emerging and submerging and, and, and kind of uh, and looping around each other and, and swirling around each other. Um, and that's very connected to, so he was a composer as well. He's one of these polymathic figures. He's a composer. He's an early collector of, uh, of Hieronymus Bosch. He's one of the only translators of uh, the Bible into Portuguese in the period. Um, he, you know, he, he writes about India and about the Ethiopians and about the culture of Lapland. He's this one of, another one of these kind of extraordinarily polymathic figures. But he also has this, as I say, a sort of synthesizing ability to uh, imagine the ways in which these things can be thought of not as othering, not as, as forms of contradistinction, but forms of uh, harmony, so it's far, you know, things that, that kind of twist together into the, the shape of the world, I suppose. Um, so that, yeah, that, that's where, obviously there are lots of other ways in which water comes into the book. Uh, obviously there's a lot of sea voyages. Um, and as you, you said at the beginning, um, you know, one of the features of this period is that connectivity uh, was largely a feature of, of sea travel. Um, and that had its own kind of perils and its own, I suppose, existential and ontological uh, experiences of storm and shipwreck and so on and so forth and, and how that made people see the world. So, yeah, there's lots of other ways in which water comes into the book. Um, yeah. That's an overview of it. Yeah, I, I don't think in our modern understanding with roads, good roads uh, through these regions that uh, you're exploring and uh, throughout southern Spain, and also throughout the European continent into England and so forth, how more, even with the shipwrecks and the dangers of sea travel, uh, it was faster and uh, so many bad things could happen over in inland travel. And we see it countlessly in novels, even in the 19th century, uh, bad things, you know, a cart can fall off a carriage and just hold you up for days. And of course, bad things can happen on a ship, but these were, these were the super highways of the period. Uh, and so uh, if you, you know, transporting goods, we also don't think of books as goods, but that, that when you're transporting a book, and this goes to your African book also, you're transporting an idea, maybe not a, not a great idea, maybe a super fantastic idea, but that's what's happening uh, in these uh, on the water. Yeah, no, it, it is a fascinating thing, and I, and I don't mean in, in the least to suggest uh, that road travel wasn't without its excitement as well you know there are these extraordinary stories of people making treks across the Pyrenees across the Alps um, and so on and so forth and again thinking about how books are transported um, so you know it's always a shock to think that books were transported usually unbound in the early modern period and mm -hmm. in order to um, you know make the space uh, of shipping most efficient um, they were often transported in barrels. So, you know, we think yeah. of boxes of books, but actually they were usually transported as, as sort of, uh, you know, barrels full of unbound pages. Um, so it puts a slightly different texture on, um, uh, you, you know, how you think about book transportation. But yeah, I mean, I think absolutely simply the, you know, uh, the act of transporting ideas in the form, in written form across spaces is uh, an immensely important symbolic, um, you know, ritual in many cultures, certainly in, you know, European Judeo-Christian culture, uh, deriving in part from the paradigm of the, you know, the Ark of the Covenant uh, being born across the desert, you know, the, the fact that the Ark of the Covenant can be born across the desert, that it survives this um, this, this transition, this, this trip across the desert is, is in some ways a kind of demonstration of, uh, you know, the, the destiny of, of the people of Israel um, and, uh, you know, the central part of, of the, you know, the, the, the testament and God's, you know, covenant with them through the testament in the form of the Ark of the Covenant, right? Yeah. Um, so I think that becomes a kind of central paradigmatic uh, device in, in cultural history.
Yeah. Well, uh, even yeah. E even with the, the yes, it is biblical because even on in the desert, when you find water, you you name it, it, it becomes a place. You name the well, it may become a city eventually, and the absence of water is dangerous and the abundance of water is dangerous and of course god parts water from water at the very beginning right in the uh, in the writings so uh there it's it's always there uh because you you uh you you can't have too much of it but if you don't have any of it you're you're done too yeah no and there's wonderful evocations of that in uh, in in jalia early arabic poetry um you know the the uh uh, the poetry of Imru al Qais, uh, for example, um, you know, uh, who talks about uh, again uh, settlements that have been kind of covered up by the by the desert. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it's a it's a kind of interesting uh, way of orienting oneself in yeah. in space. So I mean, but the, you know, this this um, ritual of carrying um, texts into unexpected spaces was in a way. Um, at the heart of uh, the, the first project um, that you mentioned, so Shakespeare, Shakespeare and Swahili land. So, mm -hmm. uh, as I as I said, you know, I grew up in East Africa, um, but I was I was very bookish and um, ended up you know going to university to study English literature and and um, uh, and then you know on to, to graduate work and, and doctoral work and, and eventually found myself um, as with a you know a job uh, in early modern English literature. Um, and realized to a certain extent that this was going to mean that I was going to spend or that I might be condemned to spend the rest of my life in cold, dusty European libraries, um, which uh, I, I love libraries. Um, I don't like cold. Um, <laughs> uh, you will also notice that a central theme of many of my works is that they take place in warm places. Yeah. Uh, and that is uh, from the very practical reason that I, um, I feel the cold very intensely. Um, so I was very happy to find a project that could legitimately take me back to, to East Africa. And it happened in a slightly kind of roundabout way. My college in Cambridge, um, one of the early fellows of the college was one of the translators of the King James Bible. Um, and uh, we celebrate, we, we organized a celebration in 2011 of the 400th anniversary of the King James Bible. Uh, and as part of that, we decided to have students and fellows and, and various other people read out uh, translations uh, of uh, the Bible uh, in, in as many languages as we could find. Um, and I, um, you know, somewhat foolhardily, uh, given my childhood in, in, in Kenya, agreed to do it in, in Swahili. Um, and so I, I found the first translation of uh, the Gospel of John. We all agreed we would do one verse. So we chose the great uh, opening of the Gospel of John. Um, and uh, in the beginning I, was the word. In, in the beginning indeed, was the word. Yes, yeah. yeah, so it's good. Yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, which is obviously you know, um, yeah. was fitting for the for that and for this conversation. So um, yeah. the um, I, I kept, you know, I found that the first Swahili translation, which um, uh, is be beautiful Swahili translation by uh, the, the, the third missionary bishop to East Africa from the um, the university's mission to Central Africa, a chap mm -hmm. called Edward Steer. And he translates um, uh, the Gospel of John, among other things, the wonderful opening, Wanzo Paliku Wana Neno, Neno Akawa Maungu, Neno Akawa Maungu. So the beginning was the word, and the word uh, was, was with God, uh, and the word was God, right? Yeah. Um, but uh, in researching, so he's translating this on the island of Zanzibar, um, off the coast of, of Tanzania in the 1860s. It just, you know, that struck me as a kind of interesting, interesting thing to look into. But um, well, well, he, he was there sponsored by the UMCA, which yep. is a consortium of four major colleges in the UK at that time, uh, Oxford, yep. Cambridge, Durham, and uh, well, yes, uh, Trinity, uh, mm -hmm. Dublin. And so he was under their sponsor sponsorship and they apparently were very well endowed going down there uh they had resources to for buildings and uh, a yeah. lot of things it seems like well it didn't quite work out like they thought so this, this all derived out of david livingston's um uh, speaking tours after his first you know trips and, and, and livingston's kind of view that um uh, east africa needed to be um 
Eastern and Central Africa needed to be converted to Christianity, uh, that it, they were in this kind of Manichaean struggle with Islam, um, and that you know, it was all tied up with, uh, with the Eastern slave trade and so on and so forth. Um, and so Steer, who's a fascinating figure, he gets sent down to, to um, Eastern Africa. They try briefly to set up on the mainland and completely fail, you know, kind of like Livingston, who during all his life managed to convert one person to Christianity, who lapsed very soon after that. One of the, one of the hilarious connecting things um, uh, in, in the work, so this, there's quite a lot of this in the new work is, is um, you know, the, the wonderful frustrations uh, of, uh, of Christian missionaries in places like Japan and in, um, uh, in India, um, who to them, what they're saying is of obvious you know, relevance and, and, uh, and truth um, and is often kind of uh, oblique and obscure and, and, uh, and slightly meaningless to the people that they're talking to who, who agree you know, agree out of politeness to add this to their list of other beliefs. Um, but they don't quite understand the idea of the Christian idea of a jealous God who will brook no rivals. So there's lots of wonderful episodes in which people, as I say, just trying to be nice to the slightly confusing missionaries, uh, agree to add uh, Christianity to a long list of other beliefs um, and, and the, the missionaries' frustration at this. But so um, they try to set up on, on the African mainland and fail and so end up in Zanzibar, which is this kind of cosmopolitan entrepot, right? It's, yeah. uh, you know, very regular traffic with the Arabic world, with India through mon the monsoon and so on and so forth. And so, uh, you know, this idea that um, East a Eastern Africa is a kind of benighted culturalist place that desperately needs Western culture is something that quickly erodes. And in fact, um, you know, Steer spends a lot of his time actually translating uh, Swahili writings in, into English. Mm. Um, and, um, you know, one of the other things that he does is, is translate um, uh, Shakespeare into Swahili. So again, this is what captivated me, that this very odd act of translating Shakespeare into Swahili in the 1860s. It wasn't a Shakespeare play per se, quite, as was quite often the case. This was a selection of tales from Charles and Mary Lamb's Tales from yeah. Shakespeare, yeah. intended as a kind of educational text yeah there, there, there's a study there's a study in how far ranging charles lamb's and charles and mary lamb's book was because i've spoken with taiwanese scholars japanese scholars yeah. uh that's their first exposure as children and that's where they kind of made a turn into yeah. an interest in shakespeare and there it is in zanzibar and of course it it's it moves into eastern to the uh mainland from Steer's uh, printing shop, right, uh, uh, in uh, Zanzibar. Is yeah. that correct? I, I, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, it's, it's, yeah, it's being, it was widely used from the, um, you know, from the 1860s to the 1960s as a, a, a central uh, textbook for teaching children Swahili. Again, you have to know a little bit about the, the bizarre history of Swahili in that Swahili was a fairly minor coastal language in Eastern Africa uh -huh. uh, when, uh, you know, when, when, the British started to colonize East Africa. Um, but like all colonizers, their, their own convenience was their main concern. Um, and so they learned the first language that they uh, encountered when they got to the coast and then made everyone else learn that uh, as they went inland. Uh, so, uh, you know, even though many more people spoke Gikuyu and, and Luanda and, 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 and sort of things like this, uh, you know, they were all made to learn Swahili. Uh, and so, uh, and, and Steer's textbook, Steer's, you know, um, uh, translations of Charles and Mary Lamb's Tales from Shakespeare were a, a central textbook in teaching this. And again, that was just, it struck me as kind of interesting thing to think about, to think about um, people reading this in 19th century East Africa and what it meant to them. Um, and, you know, obviously there is a, an element of this story that is, you know, is, is a depressing kind of um, imposition of cultural standards by a colonizer. Uh, but there's also a way in which I think rather wonderfully uh, books don't agree to um, stay within particular bounds, the bounds that authorities would like them to stay within and don't remain the possession of the powerful, much as the powerful might like them to do so. So I think quite quickly, um, you know, these, these stories get loose in East Africa and they turn up in Uganda as part of local folklore. There are wonderful stories, again, about in Zanzibar itself, 
uh, in which the missionaries go to a, um, you know, go, go to a, uh, a local um, village uh, and to watch a performance of a, a local play. Um, and it turns out to be uh, derived from Shakespeare, right? A Shakespeare play. Um, and these people, you know, it's this, this story has gone from uh, um, Steer's translation of Charles and Mary Lamb's uh, tale into Swahili and become part of the ecosystem. There's a, another wonderful story from the early 20th century in which an anthropologist um, on the Swahili coast, the North Swahili coast, I think around Lamu, goes and um, asks someone to tell me a story from your, from your culture. Um, and she starts being told this story and increase and eventually realizes that the story is the merchant of Venice. <laughs> um, and uh, she says, wow, that's amazing. It's that, that really is a story from, from, from your culture, is it? And he says, no, 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 that's not a story from my culture. I actually heard that from the Banyan um, down on the beach. So that's the Indian merchant, right? Which brings in a whole other thing, the centrality of, of Shakespeare in India in the 19th century. Right, which again has its very institutionalized authoritarian version. Um, so the, you know, the, the British colonial government require uh, Indians who want to sit the civil service exam to work for the British colonial government to study Shakespeare. Uh, so this is very institutionalized um, version of Shakespeare. But then there's also a completely, you know, untrammeled uh, interest in Shakespeare, um, but on a kind of popular level, and there are. You know, this is probably an exaggeration, but maybe not much of one. Uh, it's estimated, it was estimated one by one scholar that by 1920, there were 4,000 translations of Shakespeare into Indian languages. Wow. Um, wow. And uh, again, because of the Indians, um, Indian laborers brought over to East Africa to build the railways, they brought Shakespeare with them. Um, and, uh, you know, there were more performances of Shakespeare plays in Indian languages in Mombasa in the year 1911 than there were in London. Um, so, you know, again, yeah. it makes one think about where we centre Shakespeare, that this is not, you know, when we think about global Shakespeare, when we think about um, cultural transmission, it's not a bipolar thing. This is not the British and everyone else, much though the British in them, you know, in many ways, in constructing global Shakespeare, want this to be seen as a kind of um, a story about British genius being accepted by and recognised by the world. The story really isn't that story. Um, many of the great, you know, global Shakespeare traditions have a very roundabout route. So again, the East African one, um, you know, often the the influence comes from from India and not from Britain. Uh, again, you know, uh, in Sudan, um, uh, there's a you know a fascinating tradition of translating Shakespeare into Sudanese Arabic. But their uh, major influences in this uh, are the Arabic, as so the Egyptian translations of the early 20th century, um, and um, the wonderful Russian cinematic tradition of Shakespeare. Right. Uh, uh, so Koizintsev, uh, Koizintsev's Lear and Hamlet, which in the 1950s and 1960s are immensely popular, right? And that's how they encounter Shakespeare. So again, when we think about the, the story of um, global Shakespeare and, and, and of cultural transmission more generally, I think, it, you know, there are, a lot, there are a lot of things that came up in researching that book that help us to dispense with this idea of, um, you know, cultural transmission being a, a kind of simple, uh, linear thing. Um, uh, yes, and this is something that has happened in Japan. And there's really no argument for Japan ever being colonized by anything Western in any real um, institutional way. You could talk about maybe the American occupation after World War II, but uh, by and large, the, the Americans left, except you know, leaving military bases. But there's and no baseball. feeling, and 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 people, yeah, the, and, 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 and and baseball, importantly, and baseball, and uh, which is one thing I'm grateful for. Well, I am too, because uh, I, I'll, I'll just go on a little rabbit trail. Uh, when I was first teaching in Japan, I was at uh, Hiroshima University, and a friend right. of mine invited me to a baseball game, and I said, "Sure, I love to sit up and uh, have whatever." It's probably not an American hot dog, but it was good food. 
And I saw him warming up and I'm thinking, I'm kind of at a, what we call in the States, a 3A, you know, a lower division in, in uh, British football below the premium league, uh, but you're still going to see a pretty good quality. And I saw the pitcher coming out warming up and I'm going, this guy's got heat. I mean, this guy is major league and they played the game and I'm going, this is, these, these guys are good. And we, in the years following, we found out how many good players were, you know, immediately transferred to the major league, but uh, some, somehow this can be related also to Shakespeare in the sense that uh, if some, if, if the uh, Japanese director or if a student gets interested in studying Shakespeare, it's not because they want to be good, uh, what, post-Victorian, uh, you know, uh, British subjects in, this, in a sense. It's because they like it and they feel perfectly free to do anything. Uh, and you see this in Kurosawa, you see it, or, you know, earlier on, but all over Tokyo now in manga and anime. Uh, these writers will take these stories and they'll bend them to do, you know, toward their audience, young adult very often. And so you see the same thing in this more modern world that you saw in early 20th century, maybe late 19th century Africa, where suddenly Shakespeare was freed from all of this, uh, from the um, Victorian and some 18th century iconography. And it's no longer a symbol of uh, a British dominance of the world. It's just some fun stuff. And artistic too. These these productions uh, uh, with the collaboration of actors, who I'm sure in many cases were very accomplished throughout towns in in, uh, in villages in Eastern Africa. I'm sure there were some very fine, interesting productions. You know, uh, I wouldn't be able to understand a Swahili, but uh, and of course here it's in, mostly in Japanese. But uh, uh, now I've been here long enough where I can understand what's going on. But uh, it's just a, that is the global Shakespeare. And I do kind of push back against some moder uh, recent critics or post-colonial critics and so forth who kind of want to lump Japan into Asia and into the, you know, oppressed nations, and uh, it, it just can't be done. And of course, uh, uh, that that's another subject of concern. But what, one of your, I mean, you early on really um, were interested in translation for a while, it seems almost exclusively, uh, maybe 15 years ago, you were working with translation and uh, that being another type of conveyance from one state to another, just like from um, uh, Seville to um, London, or you know, just taking a book there. In the process, is the, the translation is very important. And uh, if you could uh, talk just a bit before we get on to um, Hernando, uh, a bit about uh, your, uh, I'm interested in theories of translation and I don't wanna get too much in the weeds, but uh, how, how you generally have approached it. I know you did work with Sydney and Surrey, uh, two of my, uh, of course, favorites uh, and anything in Toddles Miscellany, uh, the poetry of the era. Yeah, so uh, absolutely, you know, it's, translation has been central to, to, to my work. In part, um, you know, some of that early work, you know, a lot of the work is connected by a desire to peel back some of the artificial divisions um, that 19th century nationalist uh, accounts of culture and history imposed. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I find it bizarre that I teach in an English literary um, department, you know, faculty, and um, this imposes upon us certain requirements to teach, um, you know, English literature, uh, which in the period is a is a non-existent thing. Um, uh, you know, we are required to teach a series of texts in English literature, and out of these is conjured a an impression that what these writers were doing was reading each other and responding to each other. Um, and you know, from that, we get a sense of Englishness that emerges. Uh, whereas, of course, they were all much more, uh, you know, uh, much more ardently reading texts in French and Italian and Latin and Spanish and, um, and so on and so forth. Um, and while, of course, there, you know, there was a growing sense of, of Englishness and English character, it was one that was 
you know, uh, produced entirely artificially by these very devices of seeking to produce kind of national traditions, which somehow were coherent and, um, uh, you know, continuous and, and, and discreet and unique and so on and so forth. Although funnily enough, they're always unique in exactly the same way. Um, uh, you know, and so I think central to a lot of my work has been um, a, a desire to unpick those things that, that were done to culture and literature, you know, with, which we're still very much living with today um, and which have disastrous effects, especially in our modern um, age of immense international global problems, which we struggle to deal with because we continue to think of ourselves as somehow more inherently similar to other people of our culture, um, of our nation, than, than other people, but without recognizing the extent to which these, these concepts are entirely fabricated. Um, and uh, whilst, you know, to a certain extent, perhaps they served a kind of administrative purpose uh, at some points in history that they have long outlived that purpose. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, are, are a much greater encumbrance nowadays than they are uh, something that's useful. So yeah, translators was a way to, um, you know, to look at the fluidity of the early modern book world, the ways in which texts and printers and people working in print houses moved incredibly fluidly between countries. Um, and how, you know, it's really not possible to write, um, to, to usefully or honestly write, a history of British literature or print or, or Spanish or, or French literature or print in the period, because, um, you know, that involves erecting false distinctions and false barriers between print cultures and literary cultures that simply weren't there. No. Um, uh, so, yeah, the translators, um, you know, and it's a fascinating period in which to work on translation, because obviously translation is, uh, you know, it, it is a, it's a hot topic. It's a, it's a highly, this is obviously the period in which uh, the Bible, the translation of the Bible into the vernaculars and the question of who is able to read what uh, and have access to it uh, makes the question of whether to translate or not and how to translate one of the, uh, you know, un, unparalleled uh, political uh, and cultural and philosophical questions of the day, right? So this is a very interesting time to in, in which to work on, on translation. Um, and, you know, to a certain extent, um, you know, some of that work was about how, uh, you know, the kinds of choice that people make in, in translation, um, uh, you know, on, on the one hand, uh, you know, translation has a, there's a kind of sort of double vision that occurs in translated works uh, in that on the one hand you are making something more accessible perhaps to someone who only speaks uh, the vernacular but it retains within it an authority or a trace of the culture from which you're translating it so you're not simply saying um, this is what this means you're also sort of saying this is uh, you know, this is what Virgil thought, this is what Romans thought, this is what, this is how French people think about these things to a certain extent. So you're, so, uh, you know, translation is not only an intellectual, a philosophical, a theological activity, it's a diplomatic activity. Um, it's a way of, uh, it's a conduit between increase, you know, cultures that are increasingly being told to think of themselves as discrete and separate. Um, so the translator takes on an incredibly important role in representing that other culture um, to, to the culture for whom he or, or sometimes she is, is translating. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating area which both reveals the connectivity of the early modern period, but, and as barriers begin to be erected, the surprising ways in which uh, relationships between cultures were carried on. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, right up until the late 19th century, an intellectual's job, in Matthew Arnold's view, is to go out into the world and find the things that are great in other cultures and introduce them to, to his culture. And, you know, to a certain extent, we think of the, uh, the 19th century as a period of benighted, uh, you know, imperialist self-centeredness, but actually, that's a lot more enlightened than a lot of what goes on nowadays. I mean, at the extent to which 
uh, we be we've become more resistant to the input of, of other cultures. And of course, there are wonderful breakthroughs. There are, you know, Kurosawa's films or the current fashion for um, for Korean movies and things like that. So there are there are breakthroughs. But again, we remain incredibly parochial um, and insular as societies. It's a, it's a, it's a great um, irony in, in a sense, in my reading of Arnold's uh, uh, philosophy about Shakespeare. Uh, he, he loved Shakespeare, of course, but at that time, your institution and over in Oxford, they felt that Shakespeare was in for dig. It was just not, you can just go read that. We don't have to teach it here. We teach Latin and Greek and, and, uh, and the rest of the, you know, those common folks over there, they can read Shakespeare. And I think it's Matthew Arnold primarily that pushed the notion of putting Shakespeare into mechanic schools and what we now, I think, would call uh, adult education, uh, maybe more night school programs for workers, people who had to maintain their jobs to study and that that uh, finally found its way through uh, the vociferous urgings of Churton Collins. I remember the vociferous, he finally pushed it. And that Shakespeare was taught at the University of Tokyo and at Harvard before it was taught at Oxford, I think Cambridge also. Uh, yeah. that, so there's a kind of irony that we now think of Shakespeare as being this high English culture and, and sometimes associated with the you know, elite schools in, in the UK, uh, when it really, in, in its inception, they, they didn't really want this. Uh, they thought that was more, of course, you know, you had the whole Covent Garden scene and so forth, which was pretty raucous at times uh, and could get very, you know, and they did things, you know, they cut things out and uh, did all the stuff that uh, modern Shakespeare critics complain about let's say with uh, Cohen's, uh, Joel Cohen's recent Macbeth, I saw a complaint today, in fact, when someone says he's just murdered, you know, the, the text of the, and I saw it, I loved it. I, I just I, thought, I thought it was, I know, it was fantastic. Uh, cries of disdain are always the easiest form of criticism. Um, and it yeah. always makes the critics seem like they know something that everyone else doesn't. So always be a little bit untrustworthy, untrusting of that. Um, no, I think you're absolutely right. You know, and there's a way in which, again, one of the things that looking at global Shakespeare does is uh, is knock down some of these narratives, these um, Eurocentric, Anglocentric narratives. Because again, you know, a lot of these things that you're saying, uh, Shakespeare being taught in in uh, Tokyo before it was in Cambridge. Uh, similarly, you know, often people write writing histories of Shakespeare performance um, look at. Uh, you know, Orson Welles' uh, Voodoo Macbeth production as being the kind of first instance of uh, modernising Shakespeare, taking Shakespeare and putting him in a, a completely different, uh, you know, set in Haiti. And uh, it's um, uh, 1929, I guess, Broadway. Uh, and it's a great production. It's a very interesting production. But again, yeah. they were doing it in the 19th century in India, um, you know, taking Shakespeare and modernizing and putting him in completely different uh, circumstances um, and, you know, setting Hamlet in Mukal palaces and, and um, you know, having, uh, uh, you know, the, there's a wonderful production um, of Twelfth Night, Indian production of Twelfth Night from the late 19th century, which uh, changes the shipwreck for a train wreck. Um, so, again, you know, <laughs> modernizing Shakespeare um, and again and filming Shakespeare you know we think about um, Laurence Olivier when we think about early Shakespeare but actually the first um, talky version uh, of a Shakespeare play uh, was filmed in India um, uh, was uh, Kun Kakun a version of, of Hamlet filmed in India sadly um, the, the the movie has been lost uh, at least oh. At present, uh, but uh, there, are, there are lots of stills and, and, uh, and clips from it, and, and, and it's, uh, yeah. Um, so, uh, Sorab Modi. Um, uh, but again, I think this helps us to revise this narrative, uh, these kind of linear narratives of, of culture. Um, but yeah, you're right. Uh, um, and again, we, we need to think about when thinking about the history of, uh, of culture and, and scholarship on culture, the extent to which it's always been a way of constructing authority. So Shakespeare, um, you know, um, was considered not to require sufficient technical skills um, uh, to, you know, to, to be something that, that could be taught at a university. And in fact, when it began to be taught uh, by R.A. Richards in Cambridge, it was with a, you know, it, it was with a, a quite a kind of generous and open idea. Mm -hmm that 
practical criticism, which we still teach in Cambridge, was a way in which you could take the things that you already could understand and articulate your understandings of them where, of, of it in a way that showed you that you were performing acts of analysis and um, excavation and, and criticism and philosophy in doing so, right? Uh, so it's a way of taking what you already know and, and helping you to articulate that in, in some way. Uh, but it, uh, obviously, we could I'm, go on. That, 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 there's I'm, a whole hearing, I'm hearing echoes of F.R. Levis, I think, uh, yeah. or maybe Richard's. I, I don't, the, uh, but, okay. Uh, I could go on with you on this whole subject for hours and we don't have hours. You're, you're a hard worker and you're being so generous to give us your time now. Uh, I wanted, I, I wanted to being a hard worker, but having my kids waiting at home for me to take them to the ping pong parlor. <laughs> I do want to get to uh, pivot a bit. Uh, it's a similar sort of thing, but pivot into the idea of managing information in the Colombian period in the late 15th century, when these, uh, incunabula were gathering up. And uh, of course, the difference is you don't have to write it out again if you need a copy. So suddenly you have a lot of copies of very major books and also a lot of minor stuff that was apparently the focus of Hernando Colon's uh, collection. Uh, as you uh, point out very uh, early on in that book, the, uh, his collection was massive, but it didn't have the canonical text of the period. It had what we would consider to be a, a kind of stuff that you would find in your garage, you know, uh, maybe an old album from a band that nobody's heard of now, you know, just little things. So when you're you know, people's parents die and you have to go clean out the attic, that happened to me about 15 years ago, and you just find these little this or that, and some things might have value, others not. Uh, and, uh, and that happened. And he was the, you think, the original person who said, listen, we have to find a way. Well, let's make a modern, let's make a modern um, uh, kind of analogy of not really an analogy. Uh, I was looking for a movie several movies lately that were uh, in my in my mind kind of recent but they were back in the early 80s or maybe 70s and I can't find them and you know it, you can't find them in a streaming form and you realize well they're, you know, they're on VHS uh, but who's keeping those and uh, I know Yale University has uh, collected VHS tapes recently, happily but these things disappear over time and Hernando apparently saw that very early that everything will disappear and we don't know what's valuable and not valuable. And we need to form a library and a way of uh, navigating that library uh, that keeps these things uh, beyond our time. You know, this vision of uh, and what you called uh, universal knowledge. Yeah, so he's, he's a, a fascinating figure. Um, as you say, the, the, the prospect of, of kind of cultural apocalypse was something that hung over the, the early modern period, the Renaissance period, that, that uh, the rediscovery of classical literature was, to a certain extent, uh, also the discovery of how little had survived. Mm. Right, so they become painfully aware that the great cultures of Greece and Rome, which they idolize, actually only survive in very fragmentary form. Um, and, uh, you know, this sets people to thinking of how they will, you know, how they will preserve uh, the culture of their own day, how they prevent another kind of doomsday scenario. You know, there are there are times that the um, sacking of Rome by the Landsknechts in 1529, um, that the sack of Rome, uh, you know, that there are all sorts of fears that this is the, the fall of Rome happening again, that the great cultural institutions and collections of, uh, of Western Christendom are about to be decimated again. Mm. Um, so th there is this kind of spectre of, of, of destruction lingering over the period. And um, uh, so there are a lot of book collectors, but most of them specialize in collecting, you know, manuscripts of uh, authoritative works by Cicero and Seneca and Quintilian and things like that. Uh, whereas Hernando is, is, is uh, unique in his his awareness that the way in which print was going to change the world was not just by putting um, copies of great works in everybody's hand, but simply by introducing a different scale of information, right? So it's estimated that 
um, of early print uh, uh, consisted of uh, these cheap print artifacts, right? And most of it is lost because no one thought it worth collecting, right? Uh, you know, it's, it's the sort of thing that, you know, to take another kind of modern analogy, if you think back 25 years when people were doing their first, uh, you know, uh, MySpace pages or whatever they were doing 25 years ago, uh, their first blogs, obviously we all probably me included thought of this as a kind of um you know a, a non-cultural thing mm -hmm. right something not really worth the dignity of being collected and studied and so on and so forth mm -hmm. but because of that what is now obviously um an immensely transformative uh, uh technology probably will be less well documented in its original stages than we might in the future hope it was. But this is very much the same with, with print. So, um, you know, Hernando uh, collects, he does, he does actually have in his library uh, all of the Ciceros and Quintilians and, 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 and things like that. He does have authoritative texts, but they're just swamped by the number of, of other texts because he wants to collect everything. Right, um, he talks about it uh, is his universal library as as having uh, every book in every language on every subject from within Christendom and without. So he really imagines this um, as a universal library. Now, of course, even um, as you know, even in this uh, originary act of openness, there are things that will begin to close it down because, of course, the book, uh, the codex. Um, is a very European thing. So, you know, um, you know, there's a question about whether had Hernando survived, um, uh, you know, whether the plan would have included things that are book adjacent, um, you know, the kinds of writings from cultures who uh, write on palm leaves or on, um, uh, you know, the, the kipu books of the South Americans made out of knotted string and things like that. So again, it's a very open vision for its day, um, as compared to most other collectors of the day. But it does it does have its own blindnesses and its own its own kind of um, limitations. But so yes, he is uh, the the illegitimate son of Christopher Columbus, um, and very much he you know and he, there's a, a whole other side of the story about the extent to which we owe our knowledge of Columbus to Hernando, who writes the only biography. Um, of his father um, by someone who knew him um, and it's you know his biography of his father is largely um, the source for most of the information that we have about Columbus at least up until the 19th century it's certainly the the, the source of the myth of Columbus as the kind of uh, visionary explorer that, that captivates uh, the romantic imagination and serves as a kind of foundation myth for, um, for the United States Right, um, and it's only much later in the late 19th and early 20th century that people start to kind of look at Columbus's original letters and, and realize what a complicated late medieval, um, uh, you know, mystical thinker he was and not necessarily this sort of, um, you know, rationalist pioneer um, who he, as he's, he's portrayed in, in later works and, and that to a certain extent because of Hernando's biography of him. Yeah. So he, he lives in the shadow of his, his father. Uh, um, and I think, you know, to a certain extent, wants to demonstrate himself to be his father's real son, despite being an illegitimate son, by doing something that is equivalent um, mm -hmm. to what his father did. So his father's project was, of course, as, as we all know, not to um, discover uh, the Americas. The Americas were an inconvenient, uh, in, you know, obstacle on the way to his real task, which was to circumnavigate the world, right? Um, Columbus had this mystical belief that if you could circumnavigate the world, it would set in motion the last things, the conquest of Jerusalem um, uh, by uh, the Habsburg Empire and the bringing about the about of the end of the world, right? This was, that was he was really wanting to do. He didn't really care about the Americas. Um, uh, so uh, just as Columbus wanted to circumnavigate the world, uh, universal navigation was how they called it, what they, how they thought about it. Hernando wanted to do an equivalent project, which was uh, to build a universal library, which would have all of knowledge in it. And, uh, but you know, as you say, it quickly becomes apparent that the scale of the thing means uh, that it is potentially you know, useless or even dangerous unless you have a way to organize it, mm -hmm. to, to navigate it, to make sense of it. So. Hernando was very much the person called forward by history for this task in that 
he was an obsessive maker and organizer of lists. From very early on in his life, we have lists. He make lists of everything around him, uh, which allows one to tell the story of his life in, in extraordinary detail. But um, he also, yeah, I mean, you know, he, he, he undertakes all of these kind of cataloging projects in his life. So he starts uh, a geographical encyclopedia of Spain. He has the largest collection of printed images in the day, uh, which don't survive, but the catalog of which does. Um, he starts a, a uh, what might have been the first botanical garden in Europe as a way of kind of trying to order plants. Uh, he starts a dictionary of the Latin language, um, uh, right, which um, only gets as far as the letter B. Uh, <laughs> but before, you know, before one mocks him too much, by the time he got there, uh, he had covered 1,461 very densely set manuscript pages uh, with definitions of things up to the letter B. He wonderfully ends his, uh, enter, his, his entries on the word Bebo, I drink, uh, which might suggest... <laughs> Might suggest where he got to, yeah. uh, what, what, why he got there. Uh, but he has this fascinating catalogic imagination, a desire to list and order lists about the world around him. Yeah. Um, and yeah, he, uh, so, you know, his main attention to this is, is ordering his library and the world of books um, and yeah. the world of knowledge that it Adam breaks that that's kind of connect, collected within the library. Yeah, um, well, I, you know, when I do one of these talks at the end, when we put them up, I add in the description a series uh, very often of hashtags or what we would call meta tags, uh, which is a similar thing uh, and, and pretty much almost the same. And it's just as important. I mean, if it's in a library and this is countless, and we're, I, I want to segue into the found book now here, I'm trying to cross-reference your publication that you finished this book on Cologne. And then I think roughly about the time you, you're finishing it, there's a discovery in Copenhagen. Is that right? Of, of his thousand page, I mean, there it is. And so, well, you have to sit down with uh, Professor Fernandez and <laughs> put out another book on it, do an analysis, right? Well, so um, certainly we, we talk about the Libro de Sofito. So yes, uh, this is Hernando's the kind of jewel in the crown of Hernando's project, um, which was not simply to collect and order every book in existence, but to employ a team of sumistas, of summary writers, who would read every book in the library um, and provide a summary of it, right? Wow. Um, and they didn't, you know, he had 15,321 books by the end of his life, which doesn't sound that big in, in modern terms, but was absolutely enormous at the time. Um, and, you know, an order of magnitude above the, the next largest libraries, essentially. Um, uh, and they didn't get all the way through the books during his lifetime. There was, and there was a you know, the tragic ending in which uh, his library was essentially not understood by anyone else and neglected after his death. But during his lifetime, they managed to, to summarize 3,500 books from the library. Uh, and then the Libro de los Opitomes um, uh, that has these summaries in it goes missing for 400 years. Um, and yes, um, about, you know, um, six months. Uh, so a, a version of it, a, a, a very rough, very difficult to read version of about 500 of these epitomies still survives, still survived and was known about uh, in his, in the remainder of his library in Seville. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, between the publication of the American and the the, the British and the American versions of my biography, someone sitting, uh, you know, in, in, in Copenhagen in this wonderful collection, the Arnhemenean collection, recognised as a professor in the University of Windsor, Guy Lazur, recognised that this might have been something to do with Hernando's library. Um, and um, through, you know, a chain of, of connections, uh, they brought this to the attention of myself and, and Jose Maria Perez Fernandez, my collaborator with whom I was already, I had already been working for a decade on, uh, on the kind of scholarly study of Hernando's library that went alongside the, the, the biography. Uh, and so, of course, we immediately flew to Copenhagen and luckily were able to, to identify um, the, you know, that this was indeed the Libro de los Opitomes. Um, and, um, you know, there, there is now a, a team at work. So there are 2,000, a little over two, so not the whole 3,500 survives. It's a 2,000 page manuscript. There are in total about 2,300 or 400 summaries of books from the library. 
Uh, and there's now a massive project underway to um, transcribe and translate and study this manuscript based in the Arno Magnaean and, um, um, uh, and elsewhere. And I'm, um, I'm very lucky to be one of the four general editors uh, of the edition for, for Oxford, Oxford University Press. It's going to take us a while to, to, get, to get, get around to finishing, but um, it's well underway. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, it's another kind of exciting discovery and again, uh, a, a sort of wonderful coda to, to the slightly tragic end to the story um, in that it, it actually quite a few documents that had been considered to be missing uh, for 400 years uh, about wow. Hernando have turned up uh, since the publication of the biography in, in part, you know, because I, mean, I suppose it, uh, it underlines the usefulness of, of, of telling these stories and tell, talking about these stories and that just once people know what they should be looking for, uh, things get found. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, yeah, it's been, it's been very gratifying and very exciting to work on that next stage. Um, and we were able to describe, uh, to, to include a, a preliminary description and discussion of it in, in my book with Jose Maria Perez Fernandez, uh, the, the Hernando Colón's New World of Books, which is the kind of, um, attempts to be the kind of definitive study of Hernando's library and his, his various intellectual projects. And that came out from Yale University Press last year. Yeah. So that's the, sort of, um, the deep dive scholarly version of, or the scholarly study of, of Hernando's work to sit alongside the, the biography that was published slightly earlier. Yeah, well, I want to make this point uh, because it's salient. That is a deep dive and it is for scholars and it's a Yale publication. Your other books, uh, particularly Shakespeare and Swahili Land, is narrative. You have no trouble using the first person. You're traveling through there, and you're experiencing some of the uh, hardships that uh, maybe not as great as the early explorers, but they're hardships. Uh, and I love the uh, <laughs> I love the humor in showing up in Stone Town during Ramadan. <laughs> And in failing to cross-reference that, of course, with your with your research, not having a letter of introduction, and uh, have, having your university ID, which has no uh, purchase, uh, you know, and you can go home and type up your own letter if you need to, and uh, and getting lost, getting lost in Stone Town, and then uh, meeting, uh, having to wait on the director, and that sequence when you meet the director, and in that big room with the little desk. And you're sitting side by side and talking. I I uh, I couldn't get through a couple of sentences there without breaking up. I mean, it was just so Python esque. So I mean, you're 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 writing for uh, not a not a, uh, a you, yes. There's a lot of specialists can get out of this, uh, but also a, a just a reader who wants to see a narrative of a traveler examining what happened to other travelers who's interested in Shakespeare, history of the book, and how books do move. And you have that uh, common touch uh, and, and, and uh, very readable uh, touch. And, but at the same time, in a parallel uh, universe kind of in your mind, you're working on hardcore bibli bibliography and uh, uh, cataloging and doing the, the same kinds of things. There's some ref reflexivity here uh, in that you're sort of uh, a latter day uh, kind of, uh, I don't want to say facsimile, you're just sort of doing the same thing that Cologne and others did in the Renaissance. And uh, I, I just think it's, a, it's sort of a new field of study. It's very adventurous. I love the titles that you have picked because uh, <laughs> unlike the titles of some of my articles, which could put you to sleep before you finish reading the title, but shipwreck books, there's nothing more exciting than the thought of shipwrecks. You know, you're out on the open seas and you don't think about, you think about gold, you know, the valuables or certain, certain things, maybe uh, uh, bones of the uh, people who didn't survive, you know, some uh, horror movie type stuff or, and, uh, you know, but exciting. And so uh, I wanted to ask you about what to expect in the future, but you, we did this. I have one more uh, question. Uh, you, did work in uh, the University of uh, uh, Granada. And 
that, that would have been for the Maria, my, my friend and collaborator, is at the, the, um, the University of Granada. So I've done various um, visiting stints there, not not as a proper visiting fellow, but um, you know to, to go visiting there. stints, yeah. But that sort of thing. But you've had the uh, you've you've had the uh, wonderful experience uh, as long as well as this guy here, me, uh, of being able to visit and spend some time in that town and in that area. And uh, what what a what a wonderful place to be able to visit and work with scholars uh, in that area. Not long ago, um, I, I was on sabbatical and I had really no connection with the university, but I wanted to go to a, uh, a place that had access to the beach, but not on the beach because the beach is, is uh, in the summer is largely uh, Southern England, as you know, and uh, you know, there, there are whole restaurants and nobody's speaking Spanish. And so I, I thought, well, Granada is good. I've been there before and I liked it, but I want to be in a village. So I went up to Geja Sierra in the uh, Sierra Nevada range yeah. there. And I thought I can spend a month here. My wife and I can do stuff and I can do some writing. It'll be a nice, quiet village. And it was there was nothing quiet about it at all. It was during Fiesta and there were people, the bands were striking. They party till three in the morning and the bands would strike up at uh, six in the morning and march down the street and a horse. But it was absolutely fabulous. Uh, but what a, what a wonderful experience for you to be able to work with uh, such a, uh, a fine intellect and uh, to, to collaborate in that way. Uh, yeah. Yes, no, it's been a very, a very productive partnership. So we, the translation book that I uh, wrote um, uh, was with also a collaboration with, uh, with Jose Maria. Uh, yes, and it's been very fortunate for me to be able to spend time in, in, in Southern Spain. But as you say, um, a very kind words about the writing. I think, you know, to a certain extent, um, we both recognize that, you know, our colleagues do uh, absolutely fascinating work in these in these highly specialized areas. But, you know, the, the academy is something that's under onslaught uh, that, um, you know, there's there are doubts in the outside world about why society should subsidize these things and so on and so forth. So I think it is incredibly important that we take all of that work um, uh, you know, that is being done by all sorts of wonderful scholars and turn it into stories that, um, you know, non-specialists can understand and understand the significance of what's happening. Um, yeah. And a sort of argument for uh, continuing scholarship and, and intellectual activity for its own sake, or, you know, by showing it's not just for its own sake, that there are huge fundamental questions that are being asked. And part of that, part of telling an entertaining story about that is by, um, you know, not presenting it as a fait accompli, not presenting it as a finished product, but uh, showing, you know, the showing the stumbling, you know, confused process um, that leads to it. So, you know, as you say, um, there's a wonderful story in which um, uh, an anthropologist or an, uh, an archaeologist um, a paleoanthropologist uh, working in Eastern Africa was asked by the press about um, his adventures, and he, his response was that he didn't he didn't have adventures. Only people who didn't plan their expeditions properly had adventures. <laughs> uh, I've had plenty of adventures, which clearly reflect on my poor planning. Um, but uh, you know, as you say, turning up in your village in the Sierra Nevada, thinking it's going to be quiet, and you know, being thrust into the middle of the the fiesta, you know, these are the um, you know, th these are the realities of writing and doing research and thinking that the world does intrude. And, and I think the world intrudes in interesting ways. And we shouldn't try and keep that out of our writing uh, because <clears throat> it's important and it's, in, uh, you know, it's significant and it's influential on in the ways we write and ways, ways we think. Um, and it's interesting. Uh, you know, people want to read about the fact that while you were doing this, you were constantly being interrupted by fiesta noises and things like that uh so i think that's you know that's it's an important part of um uh engaging the world with uh the intellectual work that's going on um in specialized disciplines well it's a new world sort of thing also because i i i was in uh, madrid and i had a very specific thing that i want i was interested in Raphael. And uh, a student of mine had been working on Raphael and Milton's grand tour. And I became interested in how Raphael, how those paintings traveled. And of course, the collection at the Prado is just uh, unmatched. And um, I, I went in there and I, when I got there, I'm going, I, 
Uh, the, yeah, it, these are fabulous. Of course, they're fabulous. And there's just painting after painting. But it's just the, the I, I got I tired fairly quickly of the crucified Christ, uh, you know, just there was just this and this and this and they, and they had a special exhibit exhibit of um, Goya at that time. And I said, well, you know, I'm here, I'm going to go in and see the Goya. I went in looking for Raphael and I came out with Goya. That's the last, oh, yeah. that's the lasting memory. And I don't know, somewhere in the, you know, some kind of obscure article that I write that that's going to go in. Uh, so, you know, you go in for one thing and you come out for another from with another and uh, Goya. Oh my, but yeah. uh, the, uh, well, and it, there's a certain extent to which Goya's work relies on a, setting the standard standards of perfection set by Raphael so in some ways they're quite um, you know quite nicely paired yeah yeah but instead of a crucified Jesus you see a lot of people getting uh getting hurt very badly being martyred very badly and the darkness into faces and the uh, nightmarish scenarios in some of those paintings but they're just so stunning and well, another thing course. yeah go ahead of course, of course the you know, the, the crucifixion is supposed to be the contemplatio Christi is supposed to be looking at something, you know, at someone being martyred and tortured in a, in a horrifying way. But, uh, you know, there are interesting ways in which um, one becomes inured to that, in which, uh, you know, uh, artistic technique is about. It's beautiful. Uh, it's beautiful. Right. I know it's, it's a very urgent thing. You know, obviously, we are constantly being flooded with uh, information about horrific happenings around the world but the tendency of the mind is to become as i say inured to it and to, to be, be able to switch it off and so i suppose part of the part of the job of of art is to try and find new ways of awakening empathy in people who are uh you know who become too used to various kinds of suffering yeah well, and a num another example of bumbling on my part is that uh, we travel from Barcelona, just rent a car and start going, you know, uh, sometimes north in the Costa Brava, and there's some great stuff uh, up around Andorra. But I like the, you know, south. And also, you know, you, know, you get into uh, Salamanca, and you go, well, there it is, but I don't know. <laughs> I don't know enough here. And you try to look into something and you go, oh my goodness, I could spend a lifetime studying this one town and the university. And then down, uh, I, I remember being in Cadiz and thinking, I, I'm, I, you know, we, we just sp spent a, a night there, a couple of days, and I'm going, I'm missing something here. You know, it's a beautiful cathedral. It has all the things that these Spanish towns have. And then Later, I learned that's the that's the um, uh, takeoff point. Uh, that's the launch of the third, not no, the second and the fourth voyage. I think of Columbus was Cadiz. But when I was there, I couldn't cross reference it, so I missed that. You know, I had to. It was a post facto uh, realization. But I, I well, think that part, happens part of, because of the success of it as a, a naval tower meant that it, you know its earlier layers were were. So, you know, had superimposed upon them uh, a lot of later, much more industrial. So, the, you know, Cadiz does not uh, does not retain quite the same character in some ways. As some some of the towns do. Yeah, yeah, I think that might have been there uh, also. Uh, but then going into Lisbon, and then kind of later understanding how central it was to the entire world of that time you know, in, in the uh, the Portuguese. So, you know, there's just so much to, to, to learn. And I think that uh, I have a, a great appreciation. Now, of course, you know, we have, uh, you, you have to find funding. Uh, the Japanese, very, uh, my university is very good about this and uh, provides it and doesn't uh, require you to, to go into a huge amount of detail about what you're doing, because sometimes you change course. Of course, when you get there, you're going, oh, I was wrong. I need to go this way. And, uh, uh, but, I love the type of scholarship that uh, that provides for us field work, uh, and I think that there's, there's a it's a call for more of it rather than just sitting in libraries and drilling down in there, which is great stuff too. 
uh, to do that sort of thing. And it did, it does remind me years ago, I was at a Marlowe conference in Cambridge, Corpus, Corpus Christi College, and I'd done some work on Marlowe and got to meet the great scholar Roma Gill, who had done uh, the editor. And she gave a paper and her paper was how she secured funding, I think maybe from Cambridge to visit Malta because Marlowe wrote the Jew of Malta. But of course, there's no way that Mar Marlowe, I don't, there's no chance that Marlowe ever went to Malta. So there's really nothing about physical Malta that has that much to do with the play. But then she got down there and she said, I started looking at things. And of course, Marlowe was using a book and she started looking at geophysical things in Malta and the book that was written about, Mar and, and she made this wonderful connection that did reveal something about the play. So, uh, Marlo is very tuned into the uh, geopolitical happenings in the eastern, uh, the eastern Mediterranean, which again is you know, something that we tend to miss nowadays, being very focused on a different geopolitical structure. We think about, you know, we, we think about very anachronistically the importance of, uh, of America and the new world um, in the 16th century. But of course, everyone in the 16th century was entirely focused on the Ottoman threat. Um, and on of course, I was thinking Ottoman. They would made it into Hungary. Uh, under Charles V, they made it into Hungary. I mean, there was a real uh, concern about that. And I think that's what, in fact, uh, solidified Thomas More's position, uh, pro-Roman position. He felt there had to be an international alliance in order to hold back the encroachment of the Ottomans, uh, that, that sort of thing. And uh, all of this is just out outrageously interesting. And, you know, here we are wandering around, which is what we're supposed to be doing when we're talking, uh, when we're speaking with uh, Wilson Lee. Uh, <laughs> we, <laughs> it has a meandering, a meandering nature to it, my thought. Yeah, and, uh, but that's how you find things. And I think that is basically a central theme in your work. Let's wander around a bit. And from this wandering, we will find the shape we're looking for eventually. Uh, Edward, I, I need to uh, uh, get off now, but uh, I, I wanted to express my appreciation, but also that we have a, a, a smallish, but a very dedicated Japanese viewership, the Shakespeare Society of Japan, my colleagues and friends in that group, and a very uh, active, and also other international scholars who are out there uh, who will be extraordinarily interested. And of course, uh, there's a ripple effect here because uh, as you, maybe we're not as, as big as some, <laughs> as some, of, uh, th some of the things on YouTube, uh, we have a ripple effect because we have students and we have uh, also more colleagues we can share things with. And I will uh, uh, make sure that they know about this. I'm sure they'll be absolutely, uh, uh, absolutely endeared with uh, your work and I hope one day we can find you right now. We can't bring people in, but one day we can find you here in Japan. If you're willing to, I'm sure you are. Uh, well, oh, yeah. you, you almost got me started on my ambition to come and watch Japanese and uh, baseball someday. Since uh, yes, the one thing, despite um, my very short residence in America at the beginning of my life that I took with me is a love of baseball, but also for global baseball. I love Cuban and Dominican and Latin American baseball, but Korean and Japanese baseball is something that I have um, to add to my list. In fact, it reminds me, your Japanese listeners may be interested in the fact that there is, in fact, a Japanese tra translation of the Catholic Columbus. shipwreck. Yeah. The, oh, oh, I, I was reading the Japanese. Yes, the, yes. Uh, that's an interesting translation. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, But yeah, that's it. Uh, I didn't know there was a Japanese translation. Indeed there is, yeah. It's a beautiful thing. I obviously can't read a word of it, so you'll have to tell me whether it's any good, but... Um... <laughs> well, I, I'll leave that to my colleagues. I, it would, uh, it takes a, I'm a, <laughs> I'm a slow reader. <laughs> yeah. it's, a very, it's a very beautiful thing. Um, yeah. And it, uh, yeah. Uh, excellent. That, and it's a beautiful cover, the uh, dust it jacket. Is, it's lovely, and they've, uh, they've illustrated it beautifully. It's got all of the all of the wonderful illustrations from the book in it. Oh, they'll love it. Who, do, yeah. who translated it? Uh, so it's Kashiwashobo, I think. Kash, uh, Kashiwasho. All right, well, I'm, I, I know there will be people who watch this who know exactly who did this. Uh, and, uh, and, and I will, uh, I will uh, let you know. <laughs> 
uh, I'll uh, ping you and let you know what uh, my super experts in Japanese translation, and I know a few of them, uh, uh, will say about the quality of the uh, prose. I'm sure it's absolutely fa fabulous. Sure it's wonderful. The translator is Kanako Igarashi, um, and I'm sure it's I'm sure it's wonderful. Oh yes, okay, okay, okay. Uh, well, we express our appreciation, the appreciation of my university and also the uh, taxpayers of Japan who provide funding for uh, these types of things for, for me to do as a foreign national teaching here, uh, which I'm very, very grateful for. And uh, I'd like you to stay just a moment after we finish, but, also, but just uh, uh, please accept our, our great appreciation and thanks for your time here today. Thanks for having me on, Tom.